Welcome to Rebuilders. I am Daniel and I'm here with Mark. And today we have an interview with Scott Souls. Mark, can you tell us a bit about Scott? Yeah, Scott is a super wise pastoral voice. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's someone who is really shaped and formed by Tim Keller. So we're going to get to ask about what that was like um, being mentored and shaped by Tim Keller. But also, you know, how do we need to change our met metrics around? Being in ministry, being a leader today, Scott's got some really wise words that I think people are going to find really encouraging and helpful. Awesome. Looking forward to it. You can find out more. We're going to chat a little bit after the interview uh, for our subscriber chats. So you can head to rebuilders.co to sign up for that. Um, but let's get into it. Well, welcome to today's episode. I am Daniel and I'm here with Mark and we have no Liddy with us today. We've lost Liddy. Where'd she go? She's here somewhere. No, she is on holidays, mm, a well much deserved. earned break, yep. yes, and uh, she's in the other hemisphere. She's in the summering hemisphere. The su summering hemisphere. Unlike our suffering hemisphere in this cold <laughs> and, and wet and yeah. flu and cold and COVID-ridden season. We're, we've got 20 more days until the end of winter. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm hopeful for, for the- the next season to come. Because literally when on the day that winter ends in Melbourne, it just instantly gets hot. It, instantly. No, it teases. It's, 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 it's like an absolute, like it's, anyway. Yeah. I always find it interesting chatting with people overseas who are in summer at the moment and they're like, oh, it's so hot right now. I'm like, what's the temperature? And now I've got to do my like Fahrenheit to Celsius oh, yeah, conversion. Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm like, oh, it's 26 degrees Celsius. That's, yeah, like, yeah, a, yeah. that's like a beautiful autumn day oh, I mean, when i was in the uk recently like it got to 19 and it was nice it was like 19 and yeah, yeah. um there's just blokes getting their shirts off <laughs> like i'm in the park and there's like it's hit 19 uh, shirts off i'm like what are you guys doing like i've got a jacket wait until you get to 40 degrees then yes you can yes put sunscreen on well i think the uk is hitting 40 this week again oh are they You're having another yeah, right. extreme weather event Ooh. Okay. Which we, well, I'm used to us having extreme weather events, but you know, yeah, yeah. I feel like that's just normal for us. Yeah, yeah. Like growing up, 40 degrees is just a. We used to go home from school back in the day, it was over 35 degrees. What's the hottest you've ever experienced? 51 degrees. 51? Where was that? The Negev? Uh, no, it was out in the, in the deserts of South Australia. Wow. What was that like? Was that just like hot. painful? It was really, it was really you, hot. Were you outside? Were you just oh, walking? Oh, yeah. I was outside. It was hot. I was working with- You were working? Sheep. You were um, working with sheep. Did the sheep- Had the sheep coat? I mean, they got coats on. They, they did. We were shearing them. But purely, I did- Purely fun, to save them from fact, the heat. Fun fact for you yeah. and our listeners, I did- My record of water consumption on one of those days was 10 litres in 10 a day. 10 litres? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. Well, not only do you have a pastoral gifting, you were in some ways involved in shepherdic work. Oh, yes. I was a, a shepherd. Were you a, technically um, a shepherd? No, you don't want like No, I was a I was a station hand or a jackaroo as we call them in Australia. So what but that's what, like a modern day shepherd, yes. Wow. It's quote unquote. <laughs> There's less shepherding and more yelling at sheep. Well, that's I reckon that's what shepherds did. And did and that's know? a good model for ministry. <laughs> But that's really what the biblical yeah, that's, model is. That's, like, that's just the, yell at people. The heart. Yell at your flock. No, only jo we're joking. Same, same. That's the complete um, opposite spirit of what today's well, about. Let We've me make an today. excellent so segue into our very pastoral interview uh, with Scott Souls today. Uh, in March 2020, sorry, in March 2012, Scott began serving as a senior pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee. He is married to Patty and has two daughters. Abby and Ellie. Previously, Scott was a lead um, was a lead and preaching pastor for Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, where he worked alongside Dr. Timothy Keller. He also planted and pastored churches in Kansas City and St. Louis, and is a frequent speaker at conferences, leadership retreats, and to university students. His most recent book is "Beautiful People Don't Just Happen: How God Redeems Regret, Hurt, and Fear in the Making of Better Humans." So, Mark, you got to sit down and interview him and uh, yeah, we're going to kick into that interview now. Yeah, oh, it's really good. People enjoy it. Yeah, great. Well, Scott, it's fantastic to have you joining us on Rebuilders. Uh, how's your day been going so far? So far, so good, Mark. Um, so I'm not sure what time it is uh, in Australia right now, but it's about 10 after 6 p.m. Uh, 
in Nashville. So it's been a very long day of staff meetings and planning and writing. So, uh, so yeah, this is a great way to uh, sort of wrap up a day like that with a conversation with somebody like you that I have great respect for. And I, I learned so much from you, Mark. So I, I'm, uh, I'm really thankful to have this conversation with you. Oh, thank you. Well, we're excited to be having this chat with you. We know that you've got lots of really fantastic things to contribute to. I think what our audience mm. is going to uh, mm. uh, be able to hear from you today. Mm-hmm. So, many of the people who listen to this podcast, um, many of them are at the sort of start or you know starting points of their sort of ministry journey. We'd love mm-hmm. to just hear your starting point of your journey into ministry. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, how did that sort of kick off? So my call to the gospel ministry uh, internally happened almost simultaneous to my call to faith in Christ. And mm-hmm. I was a was a senior in college. I had uh, I had been presented with the gospel uh, right before my college years began, and it just kind of sat on the shelf for me. Um, but, but, but never left, uh, my, uh, at least my background memory, uh, of, of the way that a certain gentleman had loved me and pointed me to Christ and, and, uh, told me of, of truths that I'd never heard before in my life. But, uh, it happened, uh, my conversion happened my senior year of college and it was through a personal, uh, existential Ecclesiastes kind of crisis, of uh, you know having the world at my fingertips and uh, wondering why on earth I was so unhappy and uh, unfulfilled and bereft of, of a sense of meaning uh, in my life. And, and so God put the right people uh, in my path, uh, fellow students uh, at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina, United States at the time. And uh, some of those people are still in, in community with us uh, even today uh, and part of our local church and, and the city we live in, Nashville, Tennessee. But um, I can remember very soon after I was converted to Christ, uh, this compelling sense of that is what I want to do with mm-hmm. my life. Uh, I, you know, I majored in business administration, but had really no interest or drive to, to go into the business world. And I, I know there are millions of people that are called uh, into that path. Uh, it just wasn't uh, ever a ca- sense of calling for me. Um, but it all seemed to come together after I came to Christ and had this, um, I don't know, uh, unshakable desire to, to pursue a life of ministry, even though the one thing I was terrified of more than anything else was public speeding, speaking, speaking, and also uh, writing. <laughs> I, w- I wasn't good at either one of those things. And in the, in the, you know, sense with the sense of humor of God was to you know make those two things, my uh, primary vocation for the rest of my life. So, mm-hmm. so here we are. And did you ever find yourself in that earlier period, um, sort of going backwards and forwards a little bit with that call? Like I find often people are trying to discern that call, and mm-hmm. there's this process. Like, is this is this a yes? Is it not? How how did you discern that call? Well, I you know it was it was a, a deep desire. Uh, so in in my tradition, uh, there are there are two elements of, of a person's call, especially into vocational ministry. The first would be the internal call, which is just this you know, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel kind of, you know, internal uh, um, drive that uh, the Apostle Paul describes in himself. And, and I think probably most people in, in ministry have undergone at some point uh, along the way. But the other is the external affirmation from people around you. And uh, I'd had some leadership experience uh, throughout high school and college and, um you know, I, I think the people around me who were wise and older uh, said, you know, hey, you're a little rough around the edges right now. You need, uh, there's a lot of learning you need to do. You need to get involved in the life of the local church to understand what that means to submit yourself uh, mm. uh, to other leaders before you're fully qualified to lead in the body of Christ. And then that led to a seminary education uh, mm. and uh, three and a half more years of kind of immersing myself into into what it meant to have a life in vocational ministry. And so we were kind of off to the races from there. Mm-hmm. Met my wife in seminary. We got married uh, the summer before my last year. 
uh, there and um, ended up planting a church in Kansas City, uh, which is Midwestern United States, and then St. Louis, uh, another church plant we were part of, and then spent five years at Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City, which some of your your listeners, I'm sure, have heard of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got to serve with Tim Keller and crew there and was a lead and preaching pastor, a congregational lead and preaching pastor there. Uh, and then we we were called to Nashville, Tennessee 10 years ago, where I get to serve as senior pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church. And hopefully we won't move anymore and we'll, we'll spend the duration here, mm-hmm. God willing. Now, one of the things also that people are really interested on who listen to this podcast is, is I guess, context. And, you know, mm-hmm. you just mentioned there you began in Kansas and, mm-hmm. uh, and St. Louis that then you moved to New York. Um, I guess perhaps for us in Australia, we sort of see the whole country as quite post-Christian, but in mm-hmm. the U.S. it's not always the case. So talk That's to right. us about what it was like to move from those first locations of ministry then to <laughs> New York City and, and you know, that's – you know, sort of as an Australian understanding some of the American context, that's a sort of big deal in terms of a changing context. Yes. Explain that for us. So, um, candidly, uh, when I was at, uh, when I was in the Midwest, which is a, a wonderful place to live and to minister and to serve with, with delightful people. Um, but there, there was this, um, uh, this stirring, uh, that happened in my early years of pastoral ministry toward, uh, what seemed like, uh, at least in retrospect, what seems like a more urban context uh, with, with all the social, you know, challenges as well as, um, you know, things that are common to urban life that aren't necessarily as common to suburban life. And um, started listening to people like Tim Keller, uh, like John Dixon, uh, and, mm. uh, you know, from, from, from Australia and the Center for Public Christianity and Simon Smart and crew. Mm. Uh, very impactful uh, on me and in, in my formation. And then a gentleman named Jerem Bars, who was a, um, one of our seminary professors at Covenant in St. Louis, Missouri. And Jerem had spent a lot of years with Francis Schaeffer uh, mm-hmm. at Labrie, and he founded or helped to found the, the English branch, uh, branch of Labrie. And uh, which is all about, you know, immersing your, yourself into the mess or what Schaefer mm-hmm. called the warp and woof of people's lives and, mm-hmm. and uh, developing a, a rich apologetic uh, approach uh, combined with sort of the Tim Keller, Harvey Kahn emphasis on, um, you know, the city as being central to the mission of God. And so, I don't know, I was just taken with that and And that led us to St. Louis, uh, to another church plant situation that was on the edge of the urban context of, of, of St. Louis and, uh, some, some ethnically diverse, socioeconomically diverse realities in our, our context there. And then of course the call came from New York, uh, unexpectedly. And, and that was sort of the, you know, the nirvana Mm -hmm. of, of, uh, where, where my heart was headed. And it took my wife a while to get on board with that and, we almost ended up not going, uh, until we, you know, until she, uh, decided, uh, you know, with her, you know, wrestling with the Lord that this was God's call on her life as well. Uh, and now we're here in Nashville, which is really interesting. Our, you know, the main congregation of, of the multi-site now, uh, church that I serve is, is in a, in a quite suburban area. And yet, so many of the urban realities are are all over Nashville that that we came from. Mm. Uh, in fact, it was Tim Keller who sort of intrigued me um, about whether or not to even engage this conversation at all when he said the trajectory of of Nashville is is that it's becoming a a coastal city in meaning mm. in the American context is becoming more secular. It's mm. becoming more ur- urban. Uh, uh, fifth most international and, and uh, ethnically diverse city in America at the time, hmm. um, also with also a lot of segregation. Hmm. And so plenty of opportunity to continue what had started in those earlier years and also continued in New York. So this has been actually a, a, a really perfect uh, context, hmm. it seems, for us to take all that we've learned in previ- previous contexts uh, hmm. for, for, our, for our current one. Hmm. Now, you mentioned there that you, you had a chance to work alongside and learn from Tim Keller, and we know that there'd be many people listening to this podcast um, 
who you know would love to have an experience like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's actually in your book, uh, From Weakness to Strength, at the end, you sort of give a little bit of tribute to Tim Keller and yes. what he taught you. Um, mm-hmm. You don't have to go through that verbatim. Um, but yeah, I'd just be fascinated to, for you to share with the audience what you learned from that experience. Sure. And, you know, people don't have to buy uh, that book uh, from Weakness to Strength to read my thoughts and reflections Mm -hmm. on what I learned from Tim. I actually um, also put it on everything I wrote in there. I also put on my blog uh, at scottsalls.com. It's its own unique post. Um, uh, You can probably Google it, you know, Scott Sauls tribute Tim Keller and, and it'll show up in the search. But but yeah, you know, I, I went there, Mark, thinking, okay, this is the person that has essentially been a, an informal mentor to me for years, and um, God used him to ignite my own, you know, vision for, um, you know, ministry to the city and ministry to diverse communities, a thoughtful apologetic uh, approach, and and such, and thought, you know, what a great thing, what a wonderful thing it'll be to get to, to work in the same, you know, space to uh, get that direct uh, leadership and mentoring and, and be in the environment, which was, of course, absolutely wonderful. I, in my current philosophy of ministry, I'd say I probably am 90% indebted to Tim and his vision for what we're doing now in Nashville. Um, but, uh, those weren't the things that I, that I left New York with, uh, mm-hmm. as far as Tim is concerned, what I left New York with, even though I still believe he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest English speaking preacher of our time for the mm-hmm. urban context. Um, I, what I learned was, um, you know, the, the, the importance and significance of a private life mm-hmm. that, that seamlessly matches the public platform. Mm-hmm. Um, Tim is a, a person of, of deep, uh, private, personal integrity, uh, deeply committed for decades to uh, this, the, the quiet, uh, unseen spiritual forma- formation practices. Uh, for you know, nearly 60 years, he's, he's prayed through the entire book of the Psalms once a month uh, for, wow. for over 60 years, wow. read through the Bible at least once a year uh, mm-hmm. for over 60 years, and reads about 80 or so books a year to, to mm-hmm. learn and, and you know, feed his mind and his soul. Uh, and he's a man of deep prayer. If you know anybody has read his book on on prayer, you'll you'll get a window into his his you know prayer life and methodologies and so on. But but yeah, he he also uh, was remarkable in the way that he received criticism, including unfair criticism. Anybody with a with a public uh, you know the, the level of public influence that he has is going to receive uh, a good bit of critique and, and a lot of, you know, especially in the social media age. And um, never once in five years did I, did I witness him get defensive or strike back or become cynical about a critic. Uh, instead, he, he was always asking the question, even of unfair critiques, is there a kernel of truth in there somewhere that I can mm. learn from and use as an occasion to repent and learn of Jesus's uh, grace afresh. And, and so, so that was pretty remarkable, um, deeply committed marriage between him and Kathy, uh, and they struggle and suffer well. Mm. Um, you know, the current cancer, uh, battle that Tim is in is actually his second battle with cancer. Mm. He'd had uh, thyroid cancer some years prior and, um, then, and especially now I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard and read, you know, maybe, Tish Warren's interview with him in the New York Times, among other things that he said publicly, but he's saying, you know, as I'm as I'm living with an incurable cancer, um, my biggest fight is not with the cancer, but with my own response to cancer. And mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm finding that all the truths that I've been, you know, cramming into my mind and heart for all these many years are coming home to me in a way that mm-hmm. they never have before. And he said. Kathy and I are both actually happier and more joyful and at peace than we've ever been in our entire lifetimes, wow. um, which, you know, uh, that says a lot about the person. So, so if anybody that's listening is a ministry leader uh, and you want to be like Tim Keller, that's how you get there. You read the Bible for 60 years every single day and you pray through the mm-hmm. Psalms and you receive mm-hmm. criticism well and you, you, you commit to having a private virtue that, that matches or exceeds your public platform. Mm. I think that's 
like a, a such a fantastic encouragement for our leaders and it was it was interesting like i was asked the question i was just in queensland on the weekend with some younger leaders and at a dinner and happened to be sitting next to some younger leaders and, and they were in their 20s and they and they said to me the question or they asked me the question um you know what would you sort of say to your 20 they said we're, we're in our early 20s we're learning ministry you know sort of what would you say to your 20 something self having seen that incredible inner reality of Tim Keller's life, that sort of um, hidden world in some ways. I mean, it's not really hidden in that he's not hiding it. It's just the private space that often we don't see in public interface with people. Um, is there anything that you would do differently about your early ministry years, knowing what you kn- learned from Tim Keller at that stage? You know, it's like the classic thing, if you could go back and, you know, mentor yourself, <laughs> what, would yeah. you, what would you say to yourself in those earlier years after all that you've learned now? Oh man, don't take yourself so seriously. <laughs> it's mm. it's not about it's not about you and um you know the call on your life from God is is not to be amazing and create mm. amazing things or even impacting the world. That's that's not how you should be thinking about your calling. You should be thinking about your calling in terms of what is faithful, what is healthy, uh what lends itself to the love of God and the love of neighbor in your own context and according to your own gifts and opportunities. And, uh, you know, as the apostle Paul wrote from prison, uh, learn the secret of being content, uh, mm. whether living in plenty or living in want. The other thing I would say too, you know, now that I'm, I have this opportunity to, to pastor a large, um, you know, relatively thriving, um, resource church that has influence beyond itself and, you know, I've, I've published six books and all of that. And, you know, back as a young minister, I would have thought, well, that's, that's what it means to really, you know, arrive to a place where you're going to be really content with what you're doing and, and with your calling. And I, I mean, I just familiarize yourself with the book of Ecclesiastes from the very beginning and, and don't fool yourself into thinking that, you know, more and bigger ministry is going to, going to, going to solve whatever anxiety you may have about, Mm. you know, things not having as much momentum as you would like for them to have right now. Mm. And to realize too, that things like weakness, insult, hardship, persecution, and difficulty are things that Paul celebrated. Mm. Uh, they, They weren't things that Paul ever tried to escape. They were actually things that he celebrated because he, he grew to the recognition and matured to the recognition that when, when we are weak, that is when we're strong. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's in our places of weakness and setback that God's power tends to show up. Um, you know, don't forget that, you know, before Jacob became the father of Israel, God, God gave him a limp for the rest of his life, mm. uh, you know, with which he, he, he became mm. the father of, of Israel. And don't forget that Jesus was despised and rejected by men. Mm. Don't forget that Isaiah never saw the fruit of his ministry in his own lifetime, even though he's become this remarkable um, global force for, for, for transformation and redemption. He never saw it in his lifetime. And the same is true of 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 everyone listed in Hebrews chapter 11 none of them experienced the promise in their lifetime but we're looking ahead to a better country mm. i would have said you know i i would want to say to my younger self early in ministry what what ecclesiastes says to his audience remember your creator in the days mm. that you were young you know s- start mm. there aim at health and 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 you'll get whatever god decides to add to your ministry whether it's persecutions or whether it's church growth or whether it's both. Mm. Um, but you know, the, the outcomes and the results are ultimately in God's hands. And uh, that means the pressure is off of us to produce and to perform. Uh, but what our responsibility and calling is, is to, you know, do the kinds of things that, that I was, uh, taught, you know, using Tim as an example for a few minutes ago, you know, that their, their vision when they went to New York was to hopefully maybe someday be able to have, a two or 300 person congregation in a neighborhood in Manhattan that they could serve for decades mm-hmm. uh, quietly and faithfully. They never envisioned, you know, Redeemer becoming this mega global thing. That, that mm-hmm. was just never part of the deal. He never envisioned being the only pastor on the Forbes most influential people in the world list. Like he, he mm-hmm. never envisioned that kind of stuff and kind of laughs at it, kind of rolls his eyes at it if you mention it. Um, <laughs> 
those aren't the things he would put on his resume. If, mm-hmm. if he were asked to do a resume, you, you'd, you'd probably see a lot of the, you know, the gospel indicatives uh, mm-hmm. on his resume, because those are the things that, you know, from, I think, very early on, he cultivated as the main things in his life. Mm-hmm. Don't neglect your soul, um, but, but that's not strongly stated enough. Mm-hmm. Feed your soul, um, you know, pursue integrity. Uh, pursue uh, formation in ways that you know how to pursue formation into the likeness of Christ. Mm. Um, have some people to submit to. Always have other people that you're submitting to. Um, and um, the rest will take care of itself as God wills. Mm. Mm, that's so good. When you sort of look at leaders who haven't finished well, who have moments of sort of failing or things go really badly, you can often trace that back to a hurt or a wound. Mm -hmm. Um, But also what you're saying there is that um, there's an element to where that can be a source of, you know, God using in our lives to shape us. Mm -hmm. And there's almost like a fork in the road. So for those listening, we're entering in many ways a a bit more of a difficult season when we look at the world. Um, You know, we've had the challenge of COVID and there's all kinds of other crises sort of seemingly coming down the road at us at this point in time. We know many leaders are in that difficult moment. So we find lots of people almost at that crossroads where that wound, that difficulty, that hurt can either go in one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. So how have you personally learned to lead with a limp and what's that look like really in, in this sort of every, every day for you? Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning, Mark. I mean, I've, mm. I, I have a sense that I'll never master it uh, in mm. this lifetime. Uh, but I, I, I think if there's any wisdom, uh, it is that uh, the limp uh, is not something that we should try to get rid of. Mm. It, it's not something we should try to compensate for. Uh, it's actually part of the glory of how God works in the lives of his people. Um, and, um, you know, there's this, there's this lovely quote that uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came up with where she talks about how beautiful people happen. Mm. Uh, and, you know, she says, you know, and she's a, she's a grief expert and mm. a psychiatrist and says the most beautiful people we've known uh, are the ones who've known defeat, who've known suffering and setback and anticlimax and so on, um, and have somehow emerged from those depths. Mm. And she goes on to say, beautiful people don't just happen. And I think that's, a, that's just a psychiatrist way of saying that formation into people of better character um, mm. always seems to happen through disappointment and setback. And mm. I think you really you know, hit the nail on the head a minute ago, Mark, when you said those, those experiences of disappointment and setback, which of course the whole world has been through in the last two or three years Mm. with the pandemic, uh, especially how it's affected people in ministry. Um, Like you said, there's a fork in the road um, Mm. because those kinds of years can either turn us cynical or, or turn us hopeful. And it all depends on where we're plugging our, you know, the umbilical cord of our souls, you know, where, where, where it is that we are seeking to derive life. Mm. And um, if it's the suffering servant, uh, Jesus Christ, then, um, you know, those seasons cannot, can be not only withstood, but, but can become formative seasons of, you know, gaining strength. Um, mm. You know, I look at, at Paul again in, in Philippi in the, in the, when he writes the letter to the Philippians from prison um, and talks about the secret of, of being content. He says, I've learned the secret of, of being content while living in want, while I have lack, while I'm, you know, behind these bars. Um, but I've also learned the secret of content while having, contentment while having plenty, mm. which is something that isn't thought of very much when we look at that passage. But he's also saying it, it also is a secret how to be content when you've got everything you ever dreamed of. Mm. I mean, there's this quote that's been attributed to Thomas Merton. I don't know if he said it or not, but it's been attributed to him where he talks about how all my life I've been climbing the ladder of success uh, only to realize when I get to the top that it's been leaning against the wrong wall. Mm. Um, uh, Just to make sure that our, our loves are well and rightly ordered uh, Mm. as as 
given to us in scripture and mm-hmm. um you know the professionalization of ministry can i think tempt us to lose our way in that regard and we can we can subtly start to think that um we're the ones who are supposed to bear the fruit when in fact um you know the way that a tree bears fruit is, is not by exerting itself mm. but by receiving nourishment um mm. at its at, at the level of its roots mm. uh and so you know number one task i think of anybody in ministry is to stay in that rhythm of receiving nourishment mm. from the lord and from his people and and the sacraments and and all the mm. rest and and from there we can minister in strength i think <clears throat> mm, that's really good I, th- I think it was bernard lewis um the historian who was speaking about islam in 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 the medieval period and he talked about islam had a sacrament of success and just as you were talking mm. there that that came to mind that almost we've swapped out you know the sacraments <laughs> you know uh, yes. for a sacrament of success wow H- how do leaders, um, uh, you know, you just shared a vision there, but also leaders, particularly young leaders, they live in a world where they're bombarded with, you know, earthly visions of success that don't mm-hmm. align with kingdom success. Mm-hmm. And even in ministry, that, that's that been blurred at times. We've had a sacrament of success around some of our ministry metrics. Yes. At this point in time, post-COVID, lots of people like haven't come back. You know, there's lots of people look at their churches going, we're on a trajectory, we're not anymore. Um, mm. h- how do you balance that when you have this um, other feedback loop always, you know, pushing you with a different message? Um, yeah, how have you balanced that? Well, I mean, you've, I think we all have to find our go-tos, um, mm. you know, when we start feeling anxiety um, about – the things were part of the ministries that we're responsible for, presumably not measuring up to whatever criteria, um, you know, the spirit of the age um, mm. imposes on us. And in some respects, I've always just assumed that that whole, you know, sacrament of success is a uniquely American thing. But, I, you know, the more I consider it theologically, it, it's it's built into the human heart to to make our own way and to build our own towers of Babel and to set ourselves up to not feel our need for the Lord. And, Mm. um, it's tricky, uh, how, you know, ministry can, can become the avenue, uh, for (laughs) self-reliance, ironically enough, even as we're telling everybody else to rely on the Lord. But, Mm. um, goodness, for me, Isaiah has become just a regular, go to um you know the story of isaiah to me is remarkable uh Mm. in that here you have a man who was very competent i mean we 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 see this as a communicator extremely competent we can see that in his his poetry and his gift with words and and um it's right there in the 66 Mm. chapters of his prophecy um and when he meets the lord uh he and has of this vision you know, interestingly, the words there are, if you go to the Hebrew, the hem of his robe. Mm. Uh, mm. There's another place in the scripture where we talk about the hem of the, the garment of Jesus, where mm. the bleeding woman, mm. the power goes out of Christ into her when she touches the hem of his garment. And so I, those two texts are, are interconnected to me where, where that happens to her in the New Testament. And Isaiah falls apart in the temple in the presence of God. And the first thing that he does is he calls a curse down on the very um, very place of his greatest competency, his lips. Uh, mm. This is the preacher to the nation of Israel, and, and he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Why, why didn't he say my ears are unclean or my, mm. my feet are unclean? My lips, the very best part of me, uh, falls short uh, of the lowest part of God, the hem of his robe, uh, you know, just metaphorically speaking. And, of course, God sends the angel. He is relieved of his guilt. It's atoned for. Uh, his shame is covered. And then the question comes, who, who shall I send? Who will go for me? And he says, I will. Here am I, Lord. Send me. And Isaiah says that before he gets any terms for the call. There's no negotiating of a salary. 
there's no question about, well, how big is my congregation going to be? Or what city is it going to be in? Is it going to be in a cool city where I can get good coffee? Or is it going to be in some remote place where uh, I'll be isolated? He doesn't ask any of those questions. He just says, look, uh, you know, now that I've met the Lord and, and been met with his mercy and grace, uh, sign me up for anything. Mm-hmm. And, and so the Lord then gives him his job description. And the job description is you're going to inherit a people to lead and to shepherd. And starting on day one, 90% of them are going to leave you and -hmm. become hostile towards you. There will only be a tenth that remains. Mm -hmm. And and, I mean, imagine that. I mean, uh, pastors everywhere have lost touch with their people, but it's a very rare pastor who's lost touch with 90% of his people, all of whom have become hostile Mm -hmm. toward them, you know? Uh, and, and, And that's Isaiah's story all the way to the end of his life and ministry, and yet Yet in these devastating circumstances of ministry, surrounding his ministry, he writes all of these hopeful words about the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, government on David's throne, you know, forever. Uh, and then the suffering servant narratives in Isaiah 53. And then, you know, later on in, in, in later chapters, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength and mount up with wings like eagles. Um, and then you know, the thoughts of God and the ways of God are higher than ours. This is all from mm. Isaiah mm. from a context of devastation. Mm. And, and so for me, that puts any hardship or setback that I am given to endure uh, in, in proper context. We mm. have to remember, we cannot let ourselves forget that the Bible was not written uh, in, a, in a liberated um, Western hemisphere, 21st century context where there's religious freedom, mm. um, you know, and, and it was written, the whole Bible almost was written by somebody who was either in prison for their faith. Uh, they'd been exiled to a ho- hostile foreign land and turned into slaves, um, you know, or, or they were fading, facing the threat of death because of their faith. Mm. That's how the Bible was birthed. And, mm. and, um, and so we, we've got to figure out a way to identify in our own context where we suffer, where we experience loss, where we experience a degree of opposition, um, that that's normal. That's mm-hmm. not unusual. Those aren't things that we're meant to escape uh, so we can get back to a life of luxurious, forward moment- you know, forward-moving, momentous ministry um, Jesus said, "In this world, you'll have my, tr- you'll you'll have troubles." Mm. Uh, Jesus said about the newly minted apostle Paul, "He will have to suffer many things for mm. for for my sake." And that's the pattern that's easy to forget when you live in a land of comfort. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I I think it's more difficult in your context, uh, Mark, and, and you know, as it was in New York City, to be a public Christian. Mm. Um, you're, you're subject to ridicule, but you're, you're probably not subject to torture yet, right? Mm. Um, uh, and Americans are American Christians are barely subject to ridicule, um, mm. and if it happens, it's 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 quite rare, or or it comes through a news channel uh, as mm. opposed to in real life, you know. Um, mm. So just having that umbrella of biblical and redemptive history context. Mm-hmm. Um, is important. And, and also watching the movie Silence uh, at least once per year, if you're, mm-hmm. a, if you're in the ministry context, um, which is a vivid, um, very disturbing portrayal of the kind of persecution mm-hmm. that's happened uh, ever, since, uh, ever since faith was born. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And still happening in many places, sadly. That's right. More so today than ever before. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Uh, you know, we've spoken about Tim Keller and we're getting to this point of almost a handing over of many leaders, some older leaders who have led for a long time and invested. Mm-hmm. Um, some aren't finishing well. Some, I think like Tim, are in that period of finishing well. Mm-hmm. Um just saw um, the other week um, Nikki Gumbel at HTB and handing yes. across, you know, mm-hmm. to Archie uh, Coates the sort of leadership there, and uh, we're at a bit of a, a handover moment. What's your hope 
for the next generation of leaders to emerge? What sort of leaders, how, how, do they, how should they lead? What's your hope for them? Um, what's your advice to them? Uh, uh, goodness gracious. Um, where do you begin? Uh, aim at health mm. and you will get fruitfulness thrown in. Mm. You know, aim at health and, and you will get meaningful ministry thrown in. Uh, but aim at ministry without aiming at health and you'll, you'll get neither, uh, you know, to borrow a rhetorical device from CS Lewis. Um, mm. um, uh, if, if today's cautionary tales of, of ministers who don't finish well, t- tell us anything, um, it, it really boils down to what the writer of Ecclesiastes said. Again, remember your creator, from the days that you were young and, um, you know, start early, um, you know, with uh, an ambition that is for the Lord and for his kingdom and for the love of neighbor and for self donation, uh, Mm -hmm. in the midst of all of that, the the earlier on we, we can get started with those, those patterns. Um, which of course can only be sustained by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, mm-hmm. um, the less susceptible we will be to a moral collapse or um, to chronic anxiety that's tied to how our ministry is doing by mm-hmm. Western hemisphere success metrics mm-hmm. uh, instead of beatitude uh, you know, comparisons. Uh, the blessed are statements in Matthew five should, should be our, um, our metrics of success, so to speak, even though Mm -hmm. they're not really measurable qualities as much as they are observable qualities. Mm. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you so much for what you shared, Scott. I think there's an absolute rich, uh, sort of tapestry of things learnt, um, uh, the biblical story uh, flowing out through what you've said. And, uh, yeah, we really wish many blessings upon you and your, and your ministry, uh, and we wish many blessings on the people listening. Um, I think when I, when I listen to you and I hear this vision, it actually gives me real hope for the future. Um, in some ways, it's a return to reality. There's a, there's a sense of not giving us a fantasy, positive thinking vision of the future. It's real, mm-hmm. but it's also deeply hopeful. So thank well, you so much for sharing that message. Well, likewise, brother. And I, I would uh, be remiss not to say thank you for uh, packing, uh, regularly packing 100,000 wor- uh, words of, of content in 25 thousand words <laughs> in, oh, in your you. books they are thank short you. they are short which which everybody appreciates and filled with so much um mentoring material um oh, thank you uh, even to an old you know an old dude like me uh, just constantly learning uh, from you and i, I hope you'll I, I know your life as a pastor is busy enough but i, I hope you'll continue to have the margin to keep putting out such rich content, content, especially your latest. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Well, many blessings and um, have a fantastic rest of your day, Scott. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Mark.